Hi, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Welcome to everyone joining us uh, at this Climate Thursdays Climate Europe uh, webinar. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you have logged in when I know there are so many demands on your time at the moment. So thank you very much. And we will hopefully do our best to make this as informative and interesting as possible. So my name is Hannah. Uh, I'm the Knowledge Exchange and Communications Manager for Blue Action. And I'm joining you here from a not so sunny Scotland. It's my privilege to kick us off today with a brief introduction to the topic. Then I'll introduce you to my colleagues who have three short presentations for you. Then we hope you'll join us in discussion at the end. There is a Q&A function. So if you have any questions or comments throughout, please add them there and we will do our best to get to everything at the end. So we're here today to talk about oceans, observations and predictions in response to the climate emergency. So you'll be relieved that we're not trying to cover too much in the next half hour or so. Uh, but what we will do is try and take you on a journey from how we observe the ocean, how those observations help us make predictions and what we can usefully do with those predictions. So it should come as no surprise to you that we are living in the midst of a global climate emergency. Countries and local communities around the world have now declared climate emergencies in response to the overwhelming evidence of the changes that we're making to our climate system. These include both the UK where I am and across the European Union, meaning that more than 500 million people are now living in states that recognize this situation. So as scientists, this may make you feel uneasy. Right, we're generally trained to avoid hyperbole and drama and, and stick to being fairly objective with facts. Or perhaps it makes you relieved. After all, people are now finally recognising what we've been communicating about for years or even decades. Perhaps let's look at it another way. Even though a lot of the focus in the news at the moment, quite understandably, is being drawn by other topics, climate change is the overwhelming problem because it is and will continue to fundamentally alter the way of life for all of us. Now, I thought this wave analogy was particularly appropriate uh, because this decision making focus has largely been land based. In fact, most of the information you might get about climate change in the sea seems to be about sea level rise. So essentially how much it is going to affect our life on land. But so many of the impacts are happening and will continue to happen in the oceans. And it's equally important to be able to understand the consequences of those impacts for us and for the global ecosystems. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about how climate change is and is going to continue to affect life in our oceans. Even if we just look at the changes that, that have an impact on us, uh, they are overwhelming. So things like rain shift in species. For example, here's a picture of some red mullet on the left. This is a new fishery that's appeared in the North Sea just in the last decade or so, also, as a result of climate change induced shifts. Of course, temperature and chemistry changes are also affecting habitats and habitat builders, such as coral reefs. And even under the most optimistic scenarios, such as the Paris Agreement, and if we achieve all our goals, we're still expecting to see a near total loss of warm water corals. And of course, many of the charismatic species in the oceans that we see are threatened and could be lost under a changing climate. I'm sure you were seeing photos of polar bears, um, we're losing whale and seabird species, and these have knock-on effects throughout the entire marine ecosystem. I am an ecologist from Scotland, so it is a legal requirement. I had a puffin picture to my talk, so I'm sorry about that. And more directly for us, these changes will have fundamental impacts for our relationship with the ocean and for the communities, businesses, and individuals that depend on it. These include food security, particularly in the global south, where ocean dependency is at its highest. The communities of the 2.5 billion people who live near the sea are threatened, and of course, the communities depend on the ocean as a source of income, such as marine tourism. Okay, so much, so depressing, I appreciate. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what we can do about it. So aside from stopping anthropogenic emissions, um, which we now know is a policy problem, not a scientific one. From a scientific perspective, fundamentally, we all want to know what the future will hold and how we can plan, adapt and adjust accordingly. Now, unfortunately, sometimes, science isn't that great at providing this answer. So one way to think about this is in terms of timescales, which you can see on a timeline here, running from days, weeks, months, into centuries into the future. So scientists, and meteorologists specifically, are very good at giving information on these short timescales now. So days, maybe a week into the future. Obviously familiar weather forecasts, and that language has now become part of how we talk and, and our day-to-day -day experience. Increasingly, we're becoming quite familiar with projections, 
to the long-term aspects of climate change out to 2100 and beyond, because this is something that's just seeing again and again. I don't know about you, when I see information and it talks about 2100 and beyond, my first instinct, my first human reaction is to be a little bit relieved because it seems so far away and therefore not my problem. Uh, if I make it to 2100, I'll be 115, um, you can do the maths. Uh, and by that point, I'm gonna be drinking gin from noon anyway. So it's more important for me and for people that live now to have to see what the changes are gonna be in our lifetimes. We need to know what these changes are on relevant timescales from five to 20 to 10 years ahead, not the next 100. So this is where this new science and particularly these three projects come in. So I can just briefly introduce the three projects that we represent in this talk, um, all of whom are looking at how we can make predictions on decadal timescales. So first we have Blue Action, which has been running since 2016 and focuses on making climate and weather predictions for the Northern Hemisphere. We have Triatlas, which started last year and is looking at predicting changes in the tropical Atlantic marine ecosystems. And finally, our brand new project, Mission Atlantic, which focuses on Atlantic ecosystems. So all of these are trying to answer the questions of how we can make predictions on relevant timescales. And so they share the same fundamental building blocks. So these include needing comprehensive and repeated ocean observations from temperature changes to current salinity. And these observations are needed to feed into computer models that can simulate Earth system processes and allow us to make predictions about what's likely to come. And finally, these projects try and turn these very complicated outputs into information that can be used here and now by the people who need it, for the basis of a climate service. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce our actual speakers who will give brief talks covering these three topics in more detail. So first we have B. Burks, who's a physical, physical oceanographer and currently climate change lead at Marine Scotland Science, who will be talking more about observations. Then we have Noel Keenleyside, who's a professor at University of Bergen, a work package leader in Blue Action and the coordinator of the Triatlas project, who will introduce the latest decadal climate model information. Then last but not least, we have Mark Payne, who is a senior researcher at the Technical University of Denmark, who will discuss marine ecological forecasting and climate services. So I'm gonna give you one last reminder that you can ask questions at any time in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. And then without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to B. Thank you, Hannah. I'm just going to um, find my screen share um, button so I can. Um, this is where I fall over already. Um, right. There we go. Hopefully you can all see my talk now. Um, so um, thank you very much, Hannah. So my name is B. Burks and I'm based at Marine Scotland Science, also in Scotland, um, a little bit further north than Hannah is. Um, and still is miserable uh, weather-wise at the moment. Um, I'm an observational oceanographer and so currently also the climate change lead. And today I'm going to take you on a journey through the ocean and particularly about how our ocean observations are contributing to our knowledge about climate change in the ocean, but also how they are starting to improve our predictions of what will happen um, on a global scale, both on um, land and in the ocean and in the atmosphere. So as Hannah said, it's now ubiquitously accepted that there is a global climate emergency. And hopefully you can all appreciate the extent of um, the problem by this graph, which shows the global temperature um, variations over the last 2000 years. Um, and it's relative to the 20th century mean. And you can really see that since the pre-industrial age where we, we've, we've um, warmed our climate by about one degree centigrade by our greenhouse gas emissions. So why should we care about the oceans when discussing climate um, and this recent paper by Karina von Schuckman and colleagues really shows um, why that is. And it's because the earth um, has an energy imbalance, which um, means that basically we're trapping heat inside the earth system, which is the greenhouse gas effect basically from our um, fossil fuel emissions and land use change. And most of that heat or that energy is being stored in the ocean. And so um, Karina von Schuckman and colleagues in a recent paper estimated that almost um, about 90% of the um, excess energy is trapped in the ocean. So it's all been absorbed by the ocean. Um, 
that is having an impact on the ocean system. Um, the latest um, the IPCC published a report last year on um, oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate, which was a very special focus topic for them, which will feed into the next um, assessment report, the sixth assessment report. And this really shows the extent of the problem is not just above water and sea level rise, as um, Hannah mentioned, but also the um, it is causing other changes. So the ocean heat content is going up, which also makes it more prevalent for marine heat waves to occur, which really impact marine life. At the same time, the ocean is also absorbing excess CO2 from the atmosphere, which is causing the pH to decrease. And so that's what we call ocean acidification. If people have heard of um, that, that's what it means. And that's causing problems for especially um, organisms which form shells, but also um, su such as corals. Um, and small phytoplankton, some of them um, form shells, but also bigger animals, um, prawns, for example, are also um, relying on some of, um, will also have problems if the ocean acidity keeps um, changing and decreasing. So um, the, and the other um, issue is really around um, sea level rise, as Hannah said, which is really um, focused most uh, in people's mind generally, because that's what will impact us the most. Um, so how do we know a lot of these changes are happening is based on our, our, our global climate observing system. And we have over the past centuries been building this up. So our knowledge of climate change in the ocean is built on this extensive um, observation network. Measurements of ocean temperature date back as far as the um, mid to early 19th century with observations collected by coastal stations such as um, lighthouse keepers were keeping records um, and also ships crossing the different ocean basins for our variety of um, industrious activities. Um, and as we've um, built our technological advances, the ocean observing system has also expanded. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd um, highlight a few here. So we now have satellites that are providing us a lot of information on surface temperature of the ocean and the distribution of ocean currents, which we can gather from um, the height of the ocean. There's some dynamics that give us um, information about that. Um, but th there are still advancing. And so one of the most recent advances is that we can now do um, we can now do salinity observations from satellites and that's a really new um, technology coming online recently. Um, but satellites unfortunately don't um, give information in the deeper layers of the ocean and here we've traditionally relied on ship observations and moorings and um, fixed, these are fixed points in the sea where instrumentation are deployed. And in more recent years we've also started um, deploying, so I don't know if um, I show you um, here, whether you can see my mouse, but there's um, hey. these kind of, yes? I'm sorry, can I just interrupt you really briefly? I wonder if you can make it a bit bigger. We've had some comments that people can't read oh. it very clearly. So just before you point to is things, that... that would be helpful. Thank you, oh. brilliant. Sorry, is this better? Yeah, much better. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry about that. Oh dear. Oh my God. Sorry, I can see the chat um, flashing, but I didn't want to get distracted by it. So my apologies, everyone, for that. Um, so hopefully you can also see um, my mouse. Yeah, we can see it, no problem. Yeah, okay, so we've now got these kind of new technologies as well that give us subsurface. So I was talking a lot about ships um, here and um, mooring, so fixed points, but recently we've started having these autonomous systems which um, are profiling floats, which I'll come back to, but also these underwater gliders are quite novel technology. They start from the sea surface and take a profile with, with as they sail down the water and then they change their buoyancy and they come back up to the sea surface and transmit their data. And we're, we're starting to deploy these instruments um, more widely and also in areas which we never really managed to go observe. So to take a ship into the Arctic or um, into the um, into the Atlantic in the middle of winter is very unpleasant or near impossible. And so we're really starting to use these um, instruments as well as tools to access um, areas that were hard to reach or traditionally we have not sampled um, very well. So 
in my next few slides, I plan to show you some, um, some of the data from these observations and um, also try to highlight how these then can incorporate into our um, prediction systems as well. And, and Noel will pick up on this and Mark as well in their talks. So this is um, data from the integrated bottom um, or the international bottom troll survey. It is um, an in, it's a effort in the North Sea and um, European continental shelf to measure um, fish stocks mainly, but actually, and um, for demersal fish, so fish that live near the seabed. Um, but actually, they also take um, oceanographic observations to um, at the same time. And so they've been um, collecting temperature and salinity data since the 1970s onwards um, every year in March. So at the end of um, winter. And this has really showed us how um, fast the North Sea is warming compared to some of the other areas around the globe. And it is actually faster than the um, global mean. On the left, you can see the linear trend for the time series between 1970 and 2019. And then on the um, right, I've actually shown the two endpoints. So you can really see the difference that that makes in the distribution of temperature. Um, and this is um, very important data. It's more traditional sampling um, effort with a ship going out um, to measure this. And it's actually a very um, integrated measuring system or observing system because it's an effort from um, all the neighboring countries around the North Sea um, and coordinated by um, ICs, which is um, great to see. And, and these observing networks really do contribute um, to our knowledge um, of the ocean. Um, so, um, Another example of ship-based measurements is these measurements along the Atlantic inflow pathway. And in the North Atlantic, um, there's a, a system of currents that transports ocean heat from the tropics all the way to the polar um, area to the Arctic Ocean. And as you're going from south to north, um, you can see that the, the pathway actually connects through um, the ocean variability. So it is a way of... Um, connecting um, all the areas along the pathway with the same variability in terms of the ocean. And that, that um, gives us some predictability to a certain extent as well in the system. And Noel will cover that a little bit more in his talk and probably in better depth. Um, but you can see that some of these time series actually, so the time series start that I've shown start in 1950, but actually the time series in my favorite area of the ocean, the Ferris Shetland Channel starts in 1893. And they're um, invaluable um, time series in terms of their length to show us um, change over decadal and multi-decadal time scales. So I thought I'd also highlight this Argo um, Profiling floats um, observing program. The Argo program, um, the Argo floats, sorry, are quite autonomous. They get deployed from a ship and they drift with the ocean currents. They start at the sea surface and then they'll um, take about three hours to go to about a kilometer depth. And there they'll drift for nine days. Then they will sink even deeper. They go down to 2,000 meters and then they'll slowly rise again to. Um, basically collect a profile of the um, of the ocean properties. So mainly temperature and salinity. But in recent years, the Argo program has also started to um, incorporate more novel sensors for the biogeochemistry. So that also includes now some sensors for carbonate chemistry, which will allow us to measure the um, ocean pH. And so the ocean acidification at a global scale. They um, have a very long life, and um, I'll come back to that in, uh, in my next slide. And um, they only sample the surface 2,000 meters at the moment, but there are also um, advances in the technology that allow us now to deploy deep Argo, which actually means we can profile the ocean basins at depths deeper than 2,000 meters, um, which is very important in basins like the um, North Atlantic, where actually a large area of the basin is deeper than 2,000 meters. So this kind of gives you a comparison of the different sampling programs that we have in the ocean. And so on the left, you can see the Global Ocean Research Ship Program, so GoShip. They are transects which were um, designed um, 
probably towards the in, in some time in the 1970s, 1980s, I think. And they are repeated, the repeat cycle is about five to 10 years for some of these transects. So some of the very big Atlantic and, and ocean basin transects we don't do very regularly. Others, which are maybe more easily sampled, we do almost on an annual basis. So it, it varies a little bit. On the right, you see the Argo profile um, network, the Argo float network. And you can really see that we have managed to put a lot of these um, floats in the major ocean basins. There are, they're not the solution to all our observing needs. Um, and you can see that actually in the Arctic, we have very few um, of these profiling floats. Um, and that is just in part also because it is very hard to put them under ice. And um, the, ocean, the way the ocean currents distribute these floats also is important um, factor in how they are distributed across the ocean basins. I've, um, on this plot, the floats are colored by how long they've been at sea. And you can see there are some that are very new to the system. So they've only been deployed in the last year or two, but actually some of them are older than five years. So they do have a long time um, life as well, lifespan. And so the final bit of the um, ocean observing system I wanted to highlight is um, these transport mooring arrays. They're close to my heart because um, I am part of the Greenland Scotland Ridge transport mooring array. My observations contribute there. That's where um, I do my studies. But we have these arrays where we put fixed point moorings in various um, parts of the Atlantic and, and other ocean basins to try and measure the ocean transport. And what we're mainly in the Atlantic trying to quantify is the ocean conveyor belt strength. So what we call the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, where warm water in the surface is traveling northwards to the poles um, and um, colder water is then traveling back at depth underneath um, in the ocean basin. These um, are very important because they are a way that the Earth system is distrib redistributing heat all the time around the globe. Um, and they also have an impact on the atmospheric um, circulation. So there's important linkages there in understanding how we um, do these measurements or the signals we're observing and then how we can represent these in, in our predictions as well. And um, so, I hope I've shown you an interesting overview of the different ocean observing um, components. Um, we've really, in the last um, 50 years, expanded the observing network um, to address some of the climate change questions and um, especially also to feed into some of the uh, numerical modeling predictions as well, which Noel will cover um, next. Okay, so I'll hand over to Noel. Hello. Okay, so let me put it into presentation mode. So good morning. I'm Noel Kingley Side from the University of Bergen and Bjergner Center for Climate Research. It's a pleasure to be here presenting in uh, the Climate Europe webinar series. So today I'd like to talk to you a bit about climate models and to explain how they can be used to make climate predictions, to tell us a little bit about how the future will be to help us address the climate emergency. I will focus on uh, the climate on the North on the Atlantic Ocean. And this talk follows on quite nicely from these because I will explain how observations can be used or how observations are central to making climate predictions. So let's start by talking about the different uh, time scales of uh, variability and the different types of prediction. So to illustrate this, I'm showing you here the annual mean temperature for Norway, historical observations since 1900 to present. The first thing that you will notice here is there's been a long term, uh, there's been a long term warming. So now Norwegian temperatures are around one degree warmer than they were 100 years ago. And so this is essentially due to anthropogenic anthrop the, the emission of anthropogenic greenhouse gases and is what the IPCC deals with. In addition, you will see superimposed on this long-term warming, decade to decade changes. So these are caused both by natural and anthropogenic factors. 
And you can see, for example, in the 1940s, it was warmer than in the 1970s, and it's again warmer. So predicting changes on these time scales is what decadal prediction aims at. In addition to this, you can see uh, strong year-to-year -year fluctuations. For example, here in 2010, it was uh, about a degree, more than a degree colder than it was in the year after or before. These year-to-year -year fluctuations are essentially what seasonal prediction aims to, to address, and they're caused mostly by natural processes in the climate system. So in, in order to make climate predictions, we need essentially four elements. We need a, comp a comprehensive representation, numerical representation of the Earth system, or the climate system, as sketched here on the, the figure to the left. We discretize essentially or represent the equations of motion, the mathematical equations of the climate system on a grid that covers the whole of the globe. The current models use a grid of around 100 kilometers horizontal resolution. In addition, we need, since these models are, are very complex and heavy to run, we need large computers, we need supercomputers. And a third element are the observations as such. And here's just a, a map of uh, Argo floats and a slightly different uh, uh, projection than, than B had shown. But these are observations are a central element to making uh, climate predictions. And this brings me to the fourth element, which is essentially data assimilation. Data assimilation is the, the method we use to synchronize the model of observations. They bridge essentially the observations and the models combining the two, taking into account uncertainties in both the observations and the models in an optimal way to uh, gain a, a best guess of the current state of the climate system. And this, this is a this is a very you may not know but actually this is a, a very important technique used in, in weather forecasting and something that actually most of us will benefit from on a day-to-day -day basis and illustrated here on the right hand side is a, uh, a forecast for the hurricane sandy in which data simulation has been used to correct the initial conditions of the storm the position the shape and the strength as well as the background uh, uh, atmospheric circulation in which the storm will evolve so that uh, better predictions can be made of, uh, of the landfall of the storm, in this case, for example, and the impacts. In, uh, in the case of the ocean, let me illustrate uh, an example of, of things that we are doing. So we use data assimilation to constrain the state of the ocean. And here's an example from the Norwegian climate prediction model. And you can see here temperatures are for the northern part of the North Atlantic, the subpolar gyre region, to be specific. And you can see, uh, the observed temperature here running until uh, uh, around 1994, five, 1994. The, the red is uh, the, the model that has been adjusted to the observations using data assimilation. So at 1994, then we switch off this synchronization of the model of the observations and we let the model run forward on its own. So without any further use of observations. And so that we can see that the, the model shows a warming in this region. So we can actually verify since it was done in the past, we can verify this with the observations. And in, so in this particular case, we can see that the model was able to, to simulate quite well or to predict actually quite well this warming. Now, this is uh, one specific case. So obviously we need to, uh, to really assess the skill of these systems. We need to, to repeat this for many cases. And so what we do is actually perform retrospective forecasts, which are also known as hindcasts. And as this is a little bit of a, complicated uh, uh, complicated uh, thing to explain and to understand. I, I have a nice schematic here provided by Mark, actually. So you can see here the forecast started in 1961 and running forward in time. Each year we start a forecast. And so we have, for example, the year one time series, then we have the year two time series, and then we continue and we have a time series for the third year. And we repeat this for uh, each of the forecasts for each year and so on. So you can see here that we can construct a time series for year one lead, we can construct a time series for year two lead, and we can construct and so on for all the year, all year leads in, in decadal forecast, this is 10 years. So essentially we can get 10 time series for 10 different lead times. And so here on the next slide, you can see the time series that have been averaged for forecast years one to nine in which predictions for the, the, the whole of the Atlantic. Here in this case, we're using the Atlantic multi-decadal variability index. 
is for, from a recent paper from Doug Smith. And uh, you can see here there's a, a remarkable agreement between the predictions of this one to nine years, from the, which are shown in red again, and the observations that are shown in black. So there's a great degree of skill in being able to predict the ocean circulation. And this comes essentially from being able to use the ocean observations that B was talking about to synchronize the, the ocean circulation state. In addition to the observations, there's also the external factors, and uh, they play a role at a global scale, which I'll show you in the next figure. So it's interesting to understand to what extent uh, predictions are, are skillful over the whole of the globe, not just the North Atlantic. And so here in the, the figure that you see on the slide at the moment, you see correlation skill. So that's essentially correlating the observations at each of the points on the grid with uh, the predictions at each of the point of the grid. And in this case, we're considering years two to five of the forecast, so two to five years ahead. And so you can see large parts of the globe in which correlations are greater than 0.7. So this is a sort of a color here, this orangey color. Dots indicate where the skill is are significant. And so it, the North Atlantic stands out as one of the regions that are very skillful, but there's other parts of the, of the globe, like the Indian Ocean and the, the Western Pacific, that are skillful. Now, you can see here is written total skill. So this skill here is coming from being able to predict the long-term changes as well as the decadal or multi-decadal changes. So the long-term changes are mostly coming from the greenhouse gases. The decadal changes are coming from being able to simulate the, the, the natural or internal processes of the climate system. So one way to assess how the ocean observations uh, uh, adding skill is to compare skills with and without data assimilation. And essentially here on the right side, you can now see the result of that comparison. So you can see the North Atlantic is one of the regions where ocean observations are critical to predicting the phase of this multi-decadal variations and to achieving skill in these regions of the globe. And with that, I'll just finish by showing that actually these activities are becoming, uh, have reached a level where they're becoming experimentally where they're being used for experimental forecasts. And for example, the WMO now releases reports since this year of how the future climate will be over the next uh, decade. And here's just a figure from a multimodal comparison that shows uh, the prediction of surface temperature for the years 2020 to 2024. So you can see there's a, a large amount of warming over the Northern hemisphere and over the North Atlantic Ocean. A lot of this is due to external forcing. So with that, I'd like to end and pass it over to Mark. Thank you. So to Thanks. Stop, stop sharing here. Thanks, Nolf and B for that introduction. Um, and for setting the scene for what I'm going to talk about now, um, about how we can actually use both these observations and models to actually develop forecasts that can be both of use to society and actually help us respond to the climate emergency and adapt to the challenges that it presents. My name is Mark Payne. I'm a researcher at the Technical University of Denmark. And the title of my talk is Climate Services and Fish Forecasts in the Atlantic Ocean. And when you hear the words fish and forecast in the same sentence. The first thing that probably comes into your mind is something a bit like the, the picture that you can see here uh, with a, a vessel, fishing vessel going out to sea in the middle of a storm. And of course, the decision to do this is based primarily on the fact that they have a good weather forecast in hand and that they are aware of what their vessel can handle and the safety risks associated. And this is just an example of one of, of many decisions that are made in the way that humans interact with the ocean. A good uh, way to understand these is actually then to go and think about this timeline that you saw at the start of the talk, uh, where we can think about the timelines and the timescales into the future, running from days and weeks all the way up to centuries. And so that type of weather forecast that the fishers had in, in hand uh, is very much on this sort of day to week timescale. Um, and it's focused very much on questions around weather and, and safety. Uh, for those that are going fishing. But there are also many, many other questions on, on different time scales and decisions that need to be made. Now, I've given some examples of these here on this slide. Um, particularly there are questions around monitoring and, and trying to estimate how many fish there are 
and using that to actually set quotas in the ocean. Uh, there are also questions around staffing of vessels and processing plants. How many people do I need to employ next year? And the questions of investment, uh, of buying new gear, of new nets, of new processing facilities and new capacity. And on the very, very long time scale, there are questions of resilience and sustainability under a change of climate. And science is very good at doing these short time scales, which you can see out here on the left hand side. And it's very good at doing the long time scales on the, the right hand side. But it's really in these intermediate time scales in the middle where there are both lots of decisions, but there's really not as much information to support the, the making of those decisions. So you can clearly see what this is then leading into, the type of work that we've just been talking about, uh, where we can take the observations that B talked about, and the computer models that Noel talked about, and bring them together to deliver climate services over here on the right hand side, societally relevant, tailored forecast products that can help people make decisions and cope with a changing and variable climate. And unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as it looks in the scheme. And the reason for that is that the observations and computer models that we've talked about give their outputs in terms of, of physical variables of the ocean. So this could be temperature, it could be salinity, it could be density, for example. And, but as we all know, fishes don't catch temperature, they catch fish. And so that means that to make this data and these forecasts useful to society, there actually needs to be a translation step where we translate the physics actually into something that is of direct interest to society, such as the abundance or the distribution of a particular fish population. That's what we've been working on in the uh, projects that are sponsoring this talk today. And I'm gonna give you a, a case study of how we did this for one particular fish stock and how we've actually made that translation from data to information. The case study is for a species called blue whiting. Um, you can see a, a picture of it here once it's been landed. Uh, it's, you may not be particularly familiar with this. This is a, a species that sits far out in the, the North Atlantic at uh, quite some depth. So it's not something that you, you catch on a Saturday morning with a fishing rod. Um, but it is nevertheless the basis for a very important and commercially valuable industrial fishery where it's used to make fish meal and fish oil. And what's particularly interesting about this species is that its distribution, where, where you find it, uh, changes quite dramatically from year to year. So over here on the, the left-hand side of the figure, you can see um, an example of a, a very expanded version of the distribution. Uh, and that was what was observed in 2007, for example. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see a very compacted distribution where the fish are essentially compacted up against the continental shelf edge as you can see going along here. And so if we look at a specific spot, for example, like, uh, far out to the west, we can see that there really is a substantial difference in the amount of fish that you get in 2007 versus 13 under these two different modes of the distribution. And that's clearly, you can imagine, as a problem for, for fishers who are going out there to try and catch the fish. They would like to know where to go. And it's a problem for the scientists that are trying to go out and monitor and measure how many fish there are. There's actually a third problem, which you've probably not thought about straight away, um, but is made apparent when we plot these colored areas on top of the map. And these are actually the exclusive, e exclusive economic zones of Ireland, the United Kingdom and the Faroe Islands after the Brexit agreements come into, um, into force at the end of the year. And in particular, what we can see is that this fish stock is actually expanding and contracting its distribution back across these international jurisdictions. And this can lead very easily to conflicts over who has the right to actually fish on the stocks. And we've already seen many examples of this type of conflict in recent years in Europe, and we expect to see more of them in the future. So you can therefore see that having a good understanding of the, the ocean variability and therefore the processes that drive this variability in the, in the distribution of fish actually has many applications and is a, a valuable tool, can potentially be a valuable tool in decision making. So to illustrate how we've actually approached this problem to understand these changes in distribution, uh, the first aspect that we've taken is we've developed a, a biological model 
to represent the relationship between the physics and the distribution of the fish. We've done this based on a large set of data that's been collected um, since the, the early 1950s. We have 35,000 observations covering um, the area to the west of Great Britain and Ireland. And you can see them uh, plotted out here on the left-hand side. The red points are presences where we've seen a fish, the gray points are where we've observed an absence. And so what we can then do is we can take this and run it through what we call an um, ecological niche model. And essentially what this does is it characterizes the habitat preferences of the organism, of blue whiting in this case, and in particularly the environmental conditions that it likes to be, to, to be found in. And so when we do that, the, we find that there's actually a very strong link to salinity in, the, uh, in this region. Uh, and we can see on the figure down here in the bottom right, salinity on the bottom axis and habitat preference, how much it likes that salinity, if you like, on the vertical axis. And so we can see very clearly that there's a, a clear window of salinity here between 35.3 and 35.5 salinity units, where the fish are actually actively seeking out that water um, to, to live in. And so you can therefore imagine that if we can predict that salinity, we can therefore predict uh, the distribution of the fish. And so this is actually what we've done. We've taken this model and we've linked it up, linked it up to the type of observation products in the first instance that B talked about and used that to actually develop near real-time forecasts of a couple of months into the future. We have an example of it here. This is a 2009 distribution where we forecasted a quite compact distribution. The colors correspond to the expected density of fish that we expect to see. And so then we've taken this and worked with industry and with the scientists that are monitoring the fish stock uh, to communicate this and try and get it into their hands and help it to inform their decision making. We actually make a really genuine climate service out of it. The ways, we've done this in a number of different ways. One way is that I've actually had a go at being a weather forecaster myself. If you go into our website, fishforecast.dtu.dk, you'll see my my attempts at standing up in front of a screen and actually giving a, a fish forecast in this case. And we also have uh, quite some documentation that we prepare every year and distribute uh, to the users that are interested in this that gives both the forecast and the caveats and uh, a guidance in how this uh, particular forecast should be interpreted. It's easy though to make a forecast, um, but making a good forecast is something else. And the question is, does this actually work? We've done the validation scientifically in, in the past, but does it actually work when we use it in the future uh, and in real life? And in fact, it does, uh, which is very relieving because it would be very embarrassing otherwise. And to illustrate one example of a successful forecast that we've had, um, this plot shows the forecast that we made in 2018. That's the background colors shown here. Uh, and this was issued in January of 2018. And then in March of 2018, three months later, uh, scientists went out and measured this distribution as part of their routine monitoring work. And that's the, uh, the heavy dots and the crosses. And you can see there's actually really quite good agreement uh, between where the fish were found, those are the dots, and where they weren't found, those were the crosses. And in particular, our forecast of a very compact distribution uh, in that year seems to have been held out by the observations. So this is a, a very positive example and a good example of, of our forecast system actually working. But just because the forecast system works doesn't actually mean it's useful. And a good forecast is one that's actually used to make decisions. And the only way that you can really assess the value of a forecast is through the lens of the actual user. And so we've been working collaborating very closely with the users to really understand whether or not this has value in their decision-making. And we have good evidence that, that it does and that it is useful. And we see it being used actively and regularly in now in the design of their monitoring uh, surveys and in the actual monitoring programs. In the figure here, we can see a comparison that we put together between the proposed survey track of where they were going to go and, and investigate this particular fish and our forecast in that particular year, so that the, the survey can essentially, it's possible to judge whether it's an appropriate survey design. Uh, we've also seen it used in a, a near real-time mode, 
uh, where we actually have essentially direct feedback between the forecast and the people that are out there in the middle of the North Atlantic measuring fish at the same time. And we've, that's led to numerous uh, real-time comparisons via Twitter with people in the middle of the North Atlantic, which is a, a novel concept, shall we say. The third and an extremely unexpected um, case where we, we could see this forecast system having value actually was this year when this particular individual popped into all our lives. And the coronavirus pandemic um, led to a substantial change in the resources that were available to monitor this fish stock and the cancellation of many vessels actually being able to go out and sail. And so we actually worked for a time with the remaining vessels to try and do an emergency redesign of the monitoring system based on the actual forecasts. And this was a, a very novel and unexpected application of our tool, but one that we can very clearly now see has quite some value in helping to optimize and, and cope with these very challenging situations. The other question that you probably are asking then is, is how far can we actually go with this? The forecasts that I showed you are, are just for a couple of months, but Noel was talking about years, up to 10 years into the future. And so what we've also done is we've taken, we've taken Noel's actual forecasts amongst others and coupled our biological model directly to it. When we do that, that gives us the ability to make biological forecasts out into the future, up to 10 years into the future. And then we can actually run these forecasts through exactly the same type of skill assessment that Noel described to you earlier to see whether they actually work. And so that's what's shown over here on the right-hand side. On the horizontal axis, we have the lead time. So how far out into the future we're making the forecast. And note that there's a change in the scale from months to years, up to 10 years in, into the future. And on the vertical axis, we have the forecast skill. So how good the forecast is. One, it's a perfect forecast. Nor zero is basically just random, meaningless guessing. Um, and so the, the forecast system, this coupled forecast system of for forecasting blue whiting distribution, when we couple the physics and the biological model, has actually a really quite um, good correlation and forecast skill up to essentially uh, six or eight years out into the future. The statistical significance threshold is about here at about 0.35. So even up to six or eight years into the future, we have a statistically meaningful forecast. Another way to actually put this into perspective is by comparing it to a persistence forecast. So this is the assumption that this works as a baseline, and that's the assumption that next year's distribution will be the same as this year's distribution. And of course, that's a very, very easy and cheap forecast to make, but it's one that we, we must outperform if this has any value. And that's what's shown here on the blue line. And we can see that that type of forecast falls to bits after two to three years into the future. And the important point is really these arrows here. It's the difference between the persistence forecast and the actual uh, decadal forecast system that we've developed, because this represents the additional skill that's attributable to our model over and above a baseline assumption. And that is coming at the end of the day from the observations that we talked about the initialization processes and the forecast models that Noel talked about. So we can really see this complete link up of, of the three different components that we've been talking about today. So in conclusion, we, uh, we conclude that for this particular case, we can actually make decadal scale biological forecasts. And then we can actually turn this into valuable climate services that can be used to inform decision making and cope with the variability of life in the ocean of this species and hopefully with many others. And therefore, this can be used as a response to the climate emergency. So with that, I thank you for your attention and pass the baton back to Hannah. Thanks, Mark. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you to all our speakers who uh, I think have provided a really interesting uh, journey from, from ocean, ocean of observations to predictions to this climate services. I hope you followed us throughout this entire talk. Um, I thought it might be helpful if I just um, gave you a brief summary of what we were talking about and then we'll have an opportunity to go to questions. And we've already had some questions coming through. So I just wanted to share that 
we've basically talked about the fact that we are starting as a scientific community to have tools that we can meet the challenge of that climate emergency I was talking about at the beginning. Um, we talked about the fact that long-term sustained observations are critical for understanding and monitoring the ocean, and we are managing that, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, Noel discussed that climate predictions provide a reliable outlook on conditions for years to come, and I think that Mark really just highlighted that by showing the success of a particular climate service and how it can translate this into valuable and actionable knowledge for people that need, that need it. So with that, I'm going to pop this up to say that um, all our speakers are available via email or online. So um, if you don't have a chance to uh, get your question answered now, you can contact them afterwards. Um, we do all have uh, project information as well. So I would encourage you to go to these websites and sign up for newsletters and find out more about it. But for now, we do have time for some questions. So thank you everyone for joining me again. Um, so the first question I think was to be, we'll go in a little bit of order. So there was a question about um, something you mentioned in one of your slides, which is, is there any reason why temperature and salinity is measured in March rather than any other month? Right, you can talk us through that. So um, I, we, we measure in other months too. I, I may not have made that very clear. I just focused particularly on the IBTS survey, which is um, at two instances in the year. There's one um, in March time and there's one in August. And I think that is related, Mark may jump in and correct me, but that is very much related to the fish uh, distributions and their biology um, about understanding when, um, we need to know where fish are, where the fish stocks are in order to inform the assessment process of um, setting fishing quotas. And so to do that, there's a timeliness um, to the events of life in March and August are the right times to go. And so they measure the oceanography then. There is a multitude of survey activity, moorings, buoys. I've not really... Um, included all of that, all the components that are there, and um, they cover the entire span of the year. The North Sea is actually one of the best measured um, systems, I think, around the globe, potentially, because there has been so much effort from European countries um, to, to measure salinity, temperature, and other properties. But the, the system is continuously running. And I think um, if people are really interested, um, I, I kind of flashed briefly the JCOM ops um, logo but if you go if you search for ocean observing or um, any of those or the euro um, goose observing system then you can really start getting a, a, a feel for how big or how much we actually do observe the ocean already um, and that's not to say that we should do less of it okay thanks i hope that answers your question anna um so i'm going to move on to a question for noel i think this is quite a, a it's quite Quite an intense question for you, Noel. I hope you're ready for this. Um, so uh, Patricia was asking that um, data assimilation appears to be critical for model predictions in the North Atlantic, uh, but does it also mean that model equations alone are not sufficient, um, therefore lacking some major terms? And if that is yes, which one is the most critical? Is it, for example, sea ice dynamics? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's nice that people have actually understood that uh, last slide, which I thought was a little bit complicated. It is a very interesting slide because it really highlighted the North Atlantic and Nordic seas as regions where data assimilation are important. But that's partly because of the, the timescales involved. So we've used a one to nine year average there. For, if I remember, no, it was two to five year, but it was still, it captures the, the multi-decadal fluctuations. That's what it's, um, it's emphasizing. So the, um, the, the basic answer to, to the question is that, uh, Across the whole of the globe, there's a pro this is my opinion, my yeah, my opinion on the answer. So, the, the, across the globe, we have variability on different timescales. The North Atlantic is a region where you have very strong multi-decadal variations, and also where the ocean plays a very important role in driving those multi-decadal variations. And actually, that graph just shows that in this region, we've been able to capture that with the models using data. There's other regions of the globe, like the Pacific, where there's also decadal variations, but they seem to be mostly driven by atmospheric variability. So I think they are much less predictable, and that's why they didn't show up in this type of figure. But if you focused on shorter time scales like ENSO, you would have got a, quite a lot in the tropical Pacific. But 
it's not to say that there's not errors in the models and the North Atlantic is one of the regions that have very strong errors and that probably limits us in, in prediction skill. So no, I wonder, is that one of the, the major challenges that we're looking to address in future projects is reducing these biases? Yes, that's exactly, a, it's a, it's, thank you. That, so I think one of the biggest challenges in climate prediction is actually model bias. It affects uh, the dynamics of the climate system and how they're represented. It's also important for the long-term changes and, and regional climate change. And it's a particular challenge when it comes to data assimilation because data assimilation relies on the model being able to represent the statistics of the, of the climate properly. And if there's model biases, it doesn't do that. So it's very difficult to use observations. So looking to how to reduce model biases is a big challenge in our community. I would also add to that, that model bias correction is absolutely essential for downstream use. If you think about my blue whiting, I'm basing it on a, on a value of 35.3 to 35.5 salinity units. If there's a systematic bias of 0.2 units, my forecast system will simply collapse. Um, so it's, it's not just in terms of the modeling prediction aspect that it's critical. It's even more important for the downstream climate services that are based on it. Okay, thanks, Mark. I guess um, in relation to that, uh, someone was wondering if you've actually seen uptake of forecasts in the fishing community. So are they trusting these forecasts yet? Um... Yes, yes, we have. Um, we have several other for forecast products. This one that I presented today is primarily in, uh, focused towards the scientific monitoring community and a little bit towards industry. But we have other products that are very industry targeted um, and that have, have quite good acceptance. Um, there's also a very good example in Australia of, but one of the challenges is it's a little bit hard to actually really quantify it because there is commercial sensitivity involved in this. Um, but the, the best example I can give you is actually from Australia where they had a, a similar forecast of Southern Bluefin tuna. And uh, the industry was interested in it, but didn't want to put a price on it. But then when they uh, proposed that closing down the service, um, there was an uproar and the industry said, no, 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 we need this. Which to me is an indication that it does have some value at least. Um, we hope to get to that stage in Europe and we are attempting to assess the value to industry, um, both industry in terms of fishing vessels and in terms of processing plants. We also have rec products that we're targeting at recreational fishes as well. So that is an ongoing uh, work to really understand how it's being used and how it's being taken up. Okay, thank you. And I think in relation to that, um, you mentioned being a fish forecaster on TV, perhaps at some point. Um, are we likely to see these kind of decadal forecasts coming available on TV or perhaps more realistically through portals like Copernicus? Um, how are people gonna be able to access these in the future? I don't think I'm ever going to be a TV star out of making fish forecasts, unfortunately. But um, the, the next step and the limiting factor has actually been the, the generation, the operational generation of decadal forecasts. Um, and the slide that Noel showed is the very last slide with the example of that is actually very new. Um, it's only really within the last six months or so that that uh, service has come online. So we expect to see, I expect to see within the next few years that these will start to be delivered through other services such as Copernicus. And as soon as that happens, then, then we can really actually start to think about these 10 year distribution forecasts being coupled directly to that and updated every year. At the moment, we are, we're limited essentially by the research products that we are able to get access to via collaborations. But that will happen and I believe it will happen very soon. Okay, I think he's passing that back to you there, Noel, as a, as a challenge. Um, I think maybe if we look a bit further upstream as well, uh, pun not quite intended there, um, B, you're talking about ocean observations, and I think from a perhaps an untrained eye, it's incredibly impressive how many ocean observations we're now managing. Um, I just want you to talk a little bit about what the next steps are. Does it need to be a uh, wider geographical range? Are we looking for greater technology? What, what, what's going to be the future for ocean observing? But I think I, I already touched a little bit on that in terms of um, advances in the Argo uh, profiling of float system um, 
is they really show we we really need to get deeper a lot I, I showed a lot of the heat is being taken up um, by the ocean and actually that's also really not just in the surface ocean that's really starting to also affect um, the ocean temperatures at depth and in order to quantify that we really need to get better um, observations there so we definitely need to go deeper we need to go more geographically broad we I, I showed the um the lack of profiling floats in the arctic which obviously the ice makes um sampling a little bit um more complex as well um but uh so we definitely need to try and start thinking about expanding our observations in the arctic and i know through blue action and some of the other um, affiliated projects we've we've really started to address that already in terms of coordinating a um, arctic observing um, network and um definitely um expanding the range of technology as well i think the the argo profiling floats are very good at getting a wide range but depending on where you deploy them they they don't linger very long so i showed the gulf stream pathway and into the um, the north atlantic current system into the arctic if you deploy an Argo float there, it very swiftly travels through the system compared to if you put it somewhere in the middle of one of the tropical gyres, um, subtropical gyres, then it will linger there for a very long time and you can get a, an observation that's quite um, targeted and contribute. So we, we need to balance these kind of trying to what we call the boundary current. So trying to observe the boundary currents with different methods to maybe what we use in the open ocean and in, into the deep as well. So, so there is a balance to be had in terms of how much we put into satellites, into the different components, which I think will be an interesting way. And, and then coordinating that effort um, globally as well. Yeah, so I guess it is quite an impressive um, international collaborative effort to create these global observing systems. Um, and I hope that's obviously continued. So Noel, did you have a point you want to make on that? Could I just add, so I didn't disagree with anything that B said, but I just wanted to point out that uh, observations of, of the biological system is a very important and actually joint observations of the physical and biological system. And that's something that I have to say, I don't know a lot about, but in practice, it's one of the things that we've been trying to address doing joint observations of physical and biological systems so that we can close the gap between the two. Yeah, I just, just to agree with Noel there, especially expanding the biological um, observations, and that is a technological problem as well. We're really starting to see these labs on a chip and, and, and technological advances that really give us new, um, you know, observations of nutrients, carbonate chemistry, um, plankton, automated um, AI to get um, plankton recognition, those, those things are really, really important too. So on that, how much are we um, working, there's a lot of kind of um, very specific types of science being represented in this panel, how much are we working with the biological scientists in order to do this? How much crossover does there need to be and is it happening? Sure I, yeah, you go first. Do, do you want me to I, th I think it is happening it's um maybe slower than people think or would like to but i you know i think we all have our own challenges in our own field and then we also need to balance that with the crossover side but it, it is definitely help, um advancing and i think especially bringing in engineers and technologists as well it will be very important so it is not just the the oceanographers and the biological, you know, the ecologists or, or biologists combining, it's also bringing in that knowledge from, from other fields to, to really um, advance knowledge. And there are some um, projects where that is already also being um, addressed or advanced, I would say. Yeah, so I think it's a very new area, actually. So in triatlus, I think it represents, you know, a very novel aspect of such a project, because often these two fields have been doing observations separately. So I think to really do a really new understanding by doing things together, the biological and physical observations. So it's very exciting, and I think it's something that is really needed, and it brings together these two type of communities, as we've been doing in this webinar, basically to show how we can address this type of climate emergency. From from my point of view, the, the there's a whole set of science that actually sits essentially even further down the value chain from from where I'm sitting that's actually looking at how 
climate services and forecast products are, are used by end users and attempting to place value on it and determine whether it's value, valuable. And a lot of that work is actually being done by economists and sociologists. Um, and you, so you can actually see that the, when you really look at the whole thing in an integrated context, it brings in so many, many uh, different disciplines from so many different sides. And that's, it really has to be said as one of the, the amazing strengths of these Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020 projects is that they have the ability to actually to, to do both transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary work uh, very, very efficiently. Um, and I think we have seen some good examples of that today. Yeah, so I, th I think you're, you're right. There's some really exciting advances, um, and I hope that we've been able to demonstrate the the, the value chain that's that's now happening and, and the transdisciplinary work. So, Mark, I have a another question for you um, regarding the kind of use of the uh, fisheries climate service. So, someone was saying that they understand that on a season to year basis, they might be of great use to help fisheries design activities. So how are decadal forecasts used? So what kind of decisions might be influenced by that level of knowledge? So at the moment, there, there isn't really any use of decadal knowledge, but that's what we're trying to pioneer in the direction that we're going in. There are a couple of different ways that we can envisage this. One is if we think about the blue whiting example uh, that I showed you, you can imagine that if you have a, a sub, expect to see in a couple of years down the track, that you are, if you're sitting in a state that's compacted and then suddenly you get an expansion coming down the, the pipeline in two or three years due to these oceanographic changes, um, that's something that you actually need to adapt your monitoring and monitoring strategies to, to actually make sure that you still get full coverage of the stock and you're trying to measure how many fish there are. Um, so that's something that if you have two or three years warning of that, you can actually potentially invest in making sure that there's sufficient vessels to cover uh, in those years, to cover the distribution in those years where we see changes. The other factor that we, we start to think about then is also with regards to productivity forecasts and transitions from, um, from high productivity states to low productivity states. This is not something that I talked about in my talk, but it's something that we're also very interested in and that has this very strong link to oceanographic conditions and is potentially predictable on this 10 year timescale. And again, you can imagine um, exactly the same type of, of thing that, that if you are forecasting a sudden uh, collapse in the productivity of the stock three or four years down the track, you can both adjust your, your exploitation accordingly so that it won't be such a severe impact on, on quota and those that are dependent on it, and the fishing industry can potentially start to think about adaptation and switching to alternative uh, catches and, and species, for example. Um, so there, there are many ways that this can be used on that decadal scale. And the further you can push it out, the, the more applications that we can uh, envisage and the greater the value it can potentially have. Uh, but we're still exploring this and there's not really any other field of the climate services community that's thinking about decadal scales. Climate service forecasting is typically on the, the seasonal scale, um, at best multi-seasonal. Um, so we are really sort of, because we're lucky to have this decadal predictability in the ocean, we're essentially trying to figure out how we can actually use it to do something useful with and to adapt to the climate emergency. So I think just, just to kind of follow on question from that, you, you mentioned it briefly, but um... How can fish forecasts be used towards sustainability of stocks? So you talk about engaging the fishing industry. Are you also engaging with, for example, policymakers on this? And how is it being um, viewed and taken up? Yes, exactly. So we have we have uh, engagement with the advice, the scientific advice that supports decision making and, and management. Um, and so it can. The example that I just gave with future changes in productivity is a good example of that. There's also a flip side that we have to be careful about because we actually have to make sure that we don't do the opposite, that we contribute or re reduce the sustainability of a fishery by giving fishes essentially too much knowledge. Um, you can imagine a situation where this would in increase the efficiency of the fishing fleets and allow them to essentially overfish the, the, the fleet, the, the stock. And particularly in, in unregulated fisheries, um, 
And it's not such a problem with, with many European fisheries because they are uh, very strictly regulated and well managed. But you can imagine in a recreational fishery, for example, where there is very little management and enforcement, this can actually quite easily lead to unintended consequences of overexploitation. So there is there's actually quite a strong ethical dimension to this of how you use and when you use and when you should make forecasts and actually when you shouldn't. And this is also something, a form of thinking that's evolving alongside the development of, of these actual, the technical aspects of the forecasts. Um, but there is certainly a thought along those in that direction, which is, is very important to have as well. Okay, thank you. I think that's actually, um getting towards quite a nice end of, of the questions and the discussion. So I just wanted to give each of you a chance to add any final comments uh, or anything else you'd like to raise before we wrap up here. Yeah, I could just add something. It's a, like a forward looking thing. So I think, you know, in Blue Action, we have been doing, we've presented what was done here and we have the link between the ecosystem models and the climate has been done mostly statistically, essentially what Mark has introduced. I think the next step is really to do this in a, in a model, a numerical modeling sense. And that's something that we're doing in Triatlas. We're trying to connect the earth system models to the ecosystem models. I think that's what an important next step to basically bring physical understanding to, uh, well, to help, under, help the understanding of the skill of predictions and to increase confidence in them. Okay, thank you. B, would you like to have a final um, comment? No, I'll, I'll maybe just add to Noel's that the, the, the underpinning there of observations will also obviously be um, needed to understand the, the dynamical links between um, the physical environment and the biological environment, which, as Noel said, we're you know we're, we are expanding our observing networks um, to make those links. So it'll be interesting. There's interesting decades to come. Thanks, um, Mark. Would you like to to finish? From from my point of view, the the biggest challenge um, and the hardest part of all this is actually the making the connection to the users and the people that actually need the information, because it's very often that there's actually <coughs> it's very often that there's not a, an awareness that we can actually make these forecasts of the ocean and that we can then actually translate them into something useful for society. So we're very, very interested in hearing of people who have problems and things that need to be specifically forecast that we can hopefully then collaborate and work backwards upstream to the likes of B and Noel and actually try and put this together in specific cases. So if there are people out there listening who are interested in having forecasts developed, please, please get in touch. We'd love to work with you. OK, thank you. I think that's a really useful final comment. Um, hopefully we've done a little bit today to getting the word out there. And hopefully everyone that's joined us has felt a little bit about the excitement of what's coming, um, what's already happened. And the kind of, I think, really, um, really interesting advances in all these fields of study that are going to help not only the kind of science, but, but obviously the communities going forward. So I'm really sorry that we have to wrap up there. Um, I do want to say thank you once again to all our speakers for what I thought was some really um, well done and fascinating talks. Uh, I'm afraid you can't hear the round of applause, but I will give you one myself and say thank you very much. Um, I know it's always difficult talking on a webinar and I think you did a fantastic job. So if we didn't get to any questions, um, please again, feel free to use the contact details on the screen to reach out to anyone individually or to any of the projects. Um, and again, I'd like to encourage you to please check out the projects as they're developing, sign up to the newsletters and find out more about how you can engage with that. But finally, I just want to say thank you to all our participants for joining us. Um, I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and I look forward to hopefully hearing from you at some point soon. Thank you very much.